Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tom Wright. I'm the director for the Center uh, of the Center for the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, and it's my great uh, privilege to chair a really interesting panel discussion for the next hour on European priorities uh, in the Middle East. And we are joined by three um, European ambassadors uh, to the United States, Ambassador Emily Haver, who is uh, the German ambassador to the US, Ambassador Karen Pierce um, from the United Kingdom, and also Ambassador Armando Verricchio, um, who's the ambassador uh, of Italy to the United States. And we've heard um, over the last couple of days a really interesting conversation on US Middle East policy and developments um, in the region in this uh, we want to uh, we want to examine uh, the European perspective uh, on the region and, of course, on the Biden administration's early moves um, on the Middle East. So we are, are not going to do particularly long introductions. We're going to jump right into the conversation. We will have um, ten or fifteen minutes at the end for your um, questions. Um, uh, I would like to start with the general question to all three of you, which is just really to describe from your country's perspective what the main sort of priorities and interests are in the Middle East, um, particularly at a moment when we see an active debate in the United States on the level of US engagement um, going forward. And uh, Ambassador uh, Verricchio, if I could start with, with you uh, and an Italian perspective, and let me just um, begin um, by passing on our condolences uh, for the, the murder of the Italian ambassador in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Luca Antonzio, and also uh, an Italian military policeman, and of course, a, a World Food Program uh, a driver and employee as well. Our, our thoughts are with Italy um, at this time, but we would, we would love your um, perspective on, 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 on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for your, your kind note. And I do appreciate, of course, that we have gone through very, very sad days. It's one of us, one of our rising stars in the Foreign Service, a wonderful person devoted to promoting a peace assistance to the least favored populations in the northern part of the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a reminder of the very meaning of our profession and what Italy stands for. So really thank you for your, for your comments. Um, now the topic of course could be more appropriate, Mediterranean. Uh, this is a top priority for, for Italy. This comes from, from history. This is really who we are, uh, is na our natural environment. Uh, the very essence of our unfolding policy is based on this opportunity to uh, have a dialogue with people uh, coming from different culture, language, religion, uh, but who share a common history. Uh, so the great, the great uh, uh, challenge is, is to turn this rich history into an opportunity to promote stability, development, growth, um, as, and to, to enter into the, the very topic of the day, um, what Italy is putting forward is not just as a nation, as a country, but also uh, we want to, to, to draw the attention of Europe to this part uh, of, uh, of the world. And in this case, also, uh, we want always to uh, remind our American friends and colleagues that, uh, uh, in a way, the Mediterranean is not just the backyard of Europe. It's also the backyard of the United States. Uh, because the stability uh, of this part of the world, uh, which we love so much, directly affects uh, American national interest. So there's a natural convergence between uh, Italian, European, and American uh, uh, interests. Uh, this is why the Mediterranean is a central component of our foreign policy. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Haber, um, perhaps we could get a, a, a German perspective um, on, on, on this question. Of course, Germany is in a different geographical position to Italy. Um, and we do hear quite a bit about a European foreign policy and European strategic autonomy. Um, but perhaps you, you could, we could start out um, by talking about Germany's um, interests and, and priorities in the region. And you're still muted, Ambassador. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, uh, uh, Tom. And I could have echoed every word uh, that my friend Armando uh, has said. Uh, and Armando, my heart goes out to you for Italy's loss too. Um, you see, uh, for Europeans, I think center stage in the region is security and stability. And in my book, stability includes economic prospects and good governance. The lack of it can affect Europe directly, as we've seen in a stark reminder in the years in 2015 and 2016. And Germany was as much affected uh, then as Italy was. Uh, so uh, Germany's position in Europe uh, does not uh, add a different uh, perspective to it, to it. And let me say this, in ministries, and I think also in think tanks, uh, experts uh, um, tend to pinpoint surgically uh, to individual problems or challenges, say the situation in uh, uh, in Libya or the situation in uh, Yemen uh, and so forth. But in truth, um, the, um, the challenges and the threats and uh, uh, the problems are very often interlinked. And I think it's fair to say uh, that in some way uh, the Middle East has uh, expanded. Uh, the um, Babel uh, um, Mandeb used to be at the border between uh, uh, the Arab world and the Horn of Africa and uh, uh, Northern Africa and the Sahel zone used to be a completely different ball game uh, than the Middle East, but that has changed. Uh, and um, when we saw uh, during the migration crisis and also the security crisis in Europe in 2015 and 2016, uh, to what extent uh, we could be affected uh, if development uh, in the entire region uh, took uh, a downhill uh, um, uh, road. Um, the people who arrived uh, in uh, in Europe, uh, in Germany, uh, to the perception here in the United States is that most of them in the fourth year uh, of the Syrian crisis came from Syria. But in truth, uh, they came from Iraq, they came from Iran, from Syria, they came from Eritrea, Somalia, uh, Libya, and Morocco. And it reminded us uh, of the fact to what extent uh, um, uh, the uh, challenges uh, the security threats, uh, or failing states, uh, the lack of economic uh, uh, prospects are actually uh, interlinked. Um, so my, um, if I were to name the one uh, priority um, uh, uh, challenge in the region uh, that would be important to me, I would say um, uh, um, take a holistic approach look at the wider, wider array of problems which are all interlinked or fuel each other. If you just surgically address individual uh, problems, you'll not get the entire picture uh, and you will not address uh, the challenges that come from a region that has, I think, expanded uh, and has certainly significantly, uh, significantly uh, uh, moved um, uh, uh, towards Europe. Uh, has, uh, is much more part of our geography uh, than it has been perhaps in the recent uh, 100 years. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador Haber. Uh, Ambassador Pierce, could we get a, a view from, from, from the UK and, and maybe also um, after, after Brexit, the extent to which the UK will still be working with its European partners um, on Middle East issues? Uh, well, I'll start with that that last point, if, if I may, Tom, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, a great pleasure uh, to be taking part in such a distinguished uh, series and also um, to Armando, uh, the, the very deepest condolences uh, from this embassy, uh, but also from the United Kingdom uh, for what happened to, to your ambassador. Um, we're going to carry on working very closely with our friends in, in Italy, Germany, uh, France, right across the, the European Union, Tom. We have um, very many uh, identity of interests. Uh, we have a, a very similar uh, approach. So um, one way or the other, uh, that cooperation uh, will continue in regional fora uh, and at places like the UN. Um, I think I'd highlight uh, four particular areas uh, and both Emily and Armando uh, covered these, but I think particularly uh, for the UK with our very deep and long-standing historical ties for better or worse uh, 
uh, in the region. I think there's something very important about putting our shoulder to the wheel to help resolve uh, the various conflicts and the various peace processes, uh, whether that's the MEP, whether that's Syria, whether it's Yemen, uh, whether it's Libya. Uh, and alongside that, uh, we have a very deep interest uh, in providing humanitarian assistance uh, to the region. For example, we've given uh, over a billion dollars to Yemen so far. So uh, that's one plank uh, of our priorities. The second plank, as Emily and Armando said, uh, is Middle East stability across the region. Uh, taking a regional approach, uh, I agree is key. Uh, and I do think it's one of the things, uh, if you like, that has been lacking uh, to date. Uh, to be able to do that, uh, to be able to also look at countering Daesh and countering ISIS, uh, that becomes a very important uh, priority for us. Uh, to be able to look at freedom of maritime security and, and navigation in, in the Gulf. And I mention that particularly uh, because it is critical to the free flow of world trade uh, to an extent that I think uh, most of us don't think about every day, uh, but it becomes incredibly uh, important. Uh, then I think there's a third short-term priority, which is centered around Iran, uh, getting Iran back into compliance uh, with the nuclear deal and charting uh, the way ahead. And back to the regional piece, uh, Iran's relations uh, with the Gulf are also critical to stability there, particularly uh, the relationship vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, uh, but also doing something about ballistic missiles uh, and security in places like Syria uh, and the threats to Israel. Uh, and then lastly, I, I would pick up on what uh, Emily and Armando said about prosperity. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the conflicts. We spend a lot of time uh, on the humanitarian, um, helping the countries of the region uh, advance and mature uh, their economies uh, is I think going to be a central question uh, for the next decade. So I, I'd highlight those four areas. Thank you, thank you. That's a, a terrific start. So what I'd like to do, I think, is come to the both the question of European solidarity and the role of the United States. Um, we uh, Ambassador Etienne had a conflict today and couldn't uh, join us, but at, at the Munich Security Conference uh, last week, um, President Macron, um, in an answer to a question, uh, did speak about the need for uh, European strategic autonomy and more. Uh, activism in the Middle East and reform of NATO, which he'd of course spoken about before, because he said that the United States is pivoting toward the Indo-Pacific and that over the long term, we are seeing this shift. We have um, seen that, of course, from US officials have spoken about that very openly. And this uh, prioritization is reflected, one might argue, in, in, the, um, in, in the makeup of the administration, the size of the team working on, on Asia uh, relative to other regions. Um, I guess my question to all of you, and perhaps we, we could start with Ambassador Haber um, on this occasion is, is twofold. First, I mean, what solidarity do Europeans uh, really need to give each other on the Middle East? I mean, how, given the fact that there are a range of, of different views and interests because of geographical location and just because of general outlook um, and interests, um, what sort of solidarity um, do we sort of expect and what would that bargain sort of look like going forward if Europe was to play a larger role? And I know you probably won't answer directly concerns about where Biden is headed, so I'm not going to ask that, but I am going to ask um, what the lesson you think is you would take from the Obama administration's Middle East policy was, whether it's in 2015 and the refugees or on anything else, what advice would you give this administration on the continuing importance of the Middle East as there is this impulse uh, to pivot to Asia? So I hope that's diplomatic enough to allow you um, to speak to it, um, knowing that you're not you're not directly um, criticizing, obviously, the new um, administration. But Ambassador Haber, perhaps we could we could start with you on this on this point. Um, I don't think you can, uh, in uh, this day and age, uh, still make a difference between the specific interests of Southern Europeans or Eastern Europeans uh, on the Middle East. 
uh, again, I return to what I said before. In 2015, we've seen a huge uh, surge in migration. The migration came across the Mediterranean, most uh, of them via Turkey, uh, but they came uh, from uh, uh, the entirety of the MENA uh, region and beyond, uh, actually. So uh, could uh, or should Germany have uh, leant back um, and uh, uh, said this is not our problem because the Mediterranean uh, is the problem of uh, the southern and east uh, the southern uh, uh, European countries. No, we couldn't. We were affected. Uh, migration affected us immediately, and along with migration, to some extent, it needs to be said also the security uh, um, uh, uh, implications that uh, uh, they um, they implied. Uh, after all, in our communication societies uh, and in our hyperconnected age uh, of globalization. Uh, um, security threats travel incredibly fast uh, and actually even uh, the united states that was not at the receiving end of the major surge of uh, migration in 2015 and 16 it was at the receiving end uh, of um, a specific terrorist uh, threat that had emerged uh, with uh, the uh, gain of territory of daesh at the time so uh, let's not delude ourselves uh, that we can eclipse uh, um, our attention in certain areas of the world because we're really in that together. Perhaps not migration-wise, but in terms of challenges and threats and extremism, uh, we are. So I don't think uh, that the United States actually can afford uh, to, to look away. Uh, and frankly, uh, even if resources uh, are going to be moved to other areas of the world, uh, <clears throat> where um, threats uh, or challenges uh, are considered to be par uh, paramount. The e uh, US cannot disinvent the role and the reputation and the clout it has uh, in its region. It, it will simply be there even if resources move. And now I uh, move to uh, what the president, what the French president, uh, um, um, I'm not saying that with the authority of the French ambassador, but uh, I quote what he said at the Munich Securities uh, um, Conference, where he said, um, as the balance uh, of the world changes, and as focus changes, uh, and as the framing uh, uh, changes, uh, we need to look at uh, different forms of burden sharing. Um, and obviously, in our own geography, uh, we are uh, um, um, uh, uh, our attention and our efforts uh, are specifically uh, uh, called for, and that covers uh, the Middle East. In this sense, uh, the European attention uh, for the Middle East, for, uh, the, um, uh, for the challenges, uh, the opportunities, uh, but also uh, um, the security uh, uh, threats, uh, well, uh, um, covering that will be a um, strategic asset of the transatlantic relationship. So in this sense, uh, I would argue uh, for burden sharing uh, in a wider picture where the Europeans uh, focus on, uh, on challenges in their uh, own geography, but reminding the Americans uh, whether we get that done and get it uh, uh, done alongside uh, with them and others uh, will have an impact uh, on American security as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador Verricchio, perhaps we could come to you next and, and uh, you know, maybe um, if you could talk about the, the, the aftermath of Munich last week, obviously, um, in, in terms of the European solidarity piece, what does Italy sort of need from the rest of Europe if we are to see this more autonomous approach going forward? But also, what would your advice be uh, to, the, to the new Biden administration in terms of how to think about the strategic importance uh, of the region? You know, Tom, uh, not just an Italian, in this case, I speak as a European, I couldn't be more satisfied and, you know, relieved by uh, President Biden's announcement that America is back, that America wants to play a full, its huge role, its huge capacity to, to, to exert leadership. Uh, I'm not amongst those who, you know, uh, claim that uh, the United States might shift its focus or its pivot to, 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 to East, to the Pacific, to Asia. Uh, what we have learned, and Emily uh, was right in uh, suggesting that 
uh, we need a holistic approach. There might be, you know, regional uh, issues, uh, uh, regional focus, but we have learned now that any problem has to be uh, uh, considered uh, on a global uh, scale. Uh, think, for example, to, to Libya, our dear Libya that uh, God has placed in front of a <laughs> coast a few not, not uh, miles across uh, the uh, uh, channel uh, in southern Mediterranean. Libya might look like a regional issue, but in reality, you have there uh, political confrontation. You have uh, the economy. You have energy. You have the, the risk of turning the country into a sort of battle, battleground for proxy war. Um, you have the risk that instability in that part of northern Africa, the uncorking of Africa, as someone has said, uh, a few years ago, would offer uh, the uh, smugglers of human beings the opportunity to uh, promote migration. And when it comes to migration, we know how sensitive this is in Europe, not just for a country like Italy, which is the first, you know, uh, point of arrival of those desperate human beings trying to, to, to uh, build a better future for themselves and their families. So, as you can see, there is a need to, to look even at specific issues, uh, considering the implications on the global agenda. Uh, President Macron is uh, pushing forward this idea of strategic autonomy. I think that it is important that Europe certainly uh, plays at full its incredible uh, opportunity to be effective, particularly in areas where we can show uh, our knowledge, our understanding, where we have means to, to, to have effect and impact. Uh, we might do this more effectively if we do work together with the Americans. And uh, when it comes to issues like Libya, or, or I might refer to Eastern Mediterranean, to uh, our great neighbor, uh, Turkey, a fellow member of NATO, by the way, all the areas that uh, Karen was mentioning earlier on. Of course, when I say Europe, of course, I include United Kingdom. So uh, United Kingdom in this kind of, uh, of issues is a full member of our European family. We cannot simply split, you know, uh, according to um, a new treaty. This goes much beyond than that. Um, Europe is much stronger and more effective when the UK is part of the, of the equation and uh, shows that uh, it's engaged. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, in these kind of areas, uh, nothing has changed in a way that uh, we uh, want to work together with the UK uh, as Europe on a whole and also in our relations with the United States. Uh, which uh, I think cannot but uh, uh, salute with great appreciation um, President Biden's uh, announcement on what has been now the big day of, uh, of America coming back on a stage, which happened last Friday. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Pierce, um, we could turn to you perhaps on, on these questions. Um, uh, of um, the European approach and, and the, of course, just advice to the Biden administration on the strategic importance, but also if you, of the region, if you might just touch on too, um, you know, how should, it seems like everyone has agreed that the UK and, and its partners in Europe will work together on these foreign policy questions. Perhaps you could elaborate on London's thinking on how that might happen. You know, there's different options out there in, in terms of going forward, whether it's a quad structure or trilateralism or other, what NATO, what's, the, what's your thinking on how Americans should, should think about uh, maintaining a common transatlantic position post-Brexit? Uh, well, thanks, um, thanks very much, Tom. I'll start with your last point, uh, if I may. Uh, there is still very many fora uh, where the UK and our European partners can come together, sometimes uh, as Europe, sometimes uh, with the United States, but always, uh, as Emily and Armando said, uh, with that notion of transatlantic 
uh, coherence. Uh, I won't say unity uh, because sometimes the ideas will be slightly different. But I think the most important thing is that you have coherence of transatlantic policy making uh, if we're to be successful uh, in the Middle East or, or elsewhere. So you have foreign ministers meeting at NATO. You have uh, very close cooperation uh, within the UN, both the Security Council, the humanitarian side, the Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva. And it is true that Britain will be in various other uh, small groups on an ad hoc basis. Uh, but as Armando was just saying, you know, we are totally committed uh, and always will be committed to the security of Europe. So we're part of these discussions, we're part of the burden sharing, uh, whether that's within NATO or whether it's joining uh, European maritime uh, ventures in the Mediterranean uh, or off the coast of Somalia to, to tackle piracy. Uh, so there are very many ways we can cooperate uh, operationally. And these issues are so, they're both chronic and acute. Uh, and we keep in very close touch, including uh, ambassadors here uh, in Washington, and that's replicated uh, around the world. Um, I think if I look at your um, question about what advice would, would one give, I, I wouldn't be <laughs> um, presumptuous, but I, I would like to highlight uh, a couple of points. Um, a pivot to the Indo-Pacific uh, makes perfect sense in geostrategic terms, as we all know. I don't think it means uh, the US turns its back uh, on other areas, um, even if resources are not as um, widespread as we all might like to see, given uh, the constraints on budgets post-COVID, uh, US attention, US power, US diplomatic influence uh, is still very important. And I completely share what Armando was saying about multilateralism and the events of last Friday. Um, I think it's also important to remember that if the US is in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and we, the Brits, also have a tilt uh, to the Indo-Pacific, recognising uh, changing great power dynamics. Uh, the Indian Ocean is next to the, the Gulf. So if you're going to talk about something like freedom of navigation and maritime security, uh, these things all form uh, a coherent whole. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, but two further points, uh, if I may. Um, I think we all learned uh, from the events of 2013 and 14 over Syria airstrikes, um, not to threaten something we're not going to carry out. Uh, I think that has uh, the worst possible uh, effect because it makes your uh, allies nervous uh, that you're not there when you say you will be. Uh, and it makes those who oppose you um, more confident and bolder uh, in what they can do. Uh, and I think we all saw that uh, over the early years uh, of Syria. Uh, and then I think the other thing I, I'd say is I really would hope that we can all get together uh, and take a very good look at what the Russians uh, are doing in the Middle East, to be honest. Um, it, it was put to me that in, in 1973, uh, the Americans achieved a very important policy goal of getting the Russians out of the Middle East uh, fundamentally uh, with President Sadat and Egypt's uh, realignment. Uh, and now look at, at what's happening. We have the Russians in Syria, we have them increasing their role in Libya, we have them in North Africa and elsewhere. At some point, we need to work out, those of us who believe in transatlantic coherence, we need to work out what we think about that uh, and what we want to do about it. And we need to work out what our offer is uh, to these Middle East countries uh, to keep them in the open societies camp. Uh, or to help them graduate uh, towards that camp. Thank you. I'm glad you brought up Russia. It's on my list. I, I, I'll, I'll pull it forward and, and follow up with you maybe on that and, and then go to our other two um, ambassadors um, as well. Um, I guess the, uh, that's a point very well taken. I think let me take a slightly different angle on it, which is as we look at the JCPOA negotiations with Iran, um, as well as broader issues in the Middle East, there is this question about what role Russia and to some extent China will, will play in that too. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? I mean, how, how should we, since, it, since Iran, you know, we're not gonna spend a huge amount of time on it today, I think because it's an ongoing negotiation, I'm sure, sure there are limits on what you all can, can say about it, but 
but how should we think about the the, the role of, of of Russia and to some degree China in that um, in that negotiation? I think it's a really good uh, question, Tom. And um, you know, having worked with the Russians and the Chinese in the Security Council on this, uh, including back in um, 2007 when we were starting the the first set of um, Iran non-proliferation uh, negotiations. Um, I, I think they have two broad aims, to, to be honest. Um, they support the nuclear deal in and of itself. Uh, they don't particularly want to see uh, a nuclear armed Iran and they don't want to see uh, anything like a nuclear arms race uh, in the Middle East. And the Chinese in particular have done some very good technical work uh, with the Iranian nuclear program uh, to make it safer uh, and more secure. Uh, but at the same time, as, as we know, the Russians and Chinese uh, do see life at the moment as the end of the West, quote, uh, as an opportunity to pull more of the emerging powers and emerging market countries uh, to their view of the world. Uh, and they do see a competition uh, to reset the rules of international uh, affairs. And in that context, uh, I don't think they mind so much if the West is divided uh, on Iran. So to a certain extent, I think their two views are in a slight competition uh, with each other. Um, but I think if things start to move uh, on the nuclear deal, and you've seen the um, offer from the European Union to chair uh, a commission, and you've seen the uh, response from the Biden administration, uh, I would be very surprised uh, if the Russians and the Chinese sought to disrupt that. Uh, but I think underlying their approach uh, is this sense that it's another, could be another opportunity uh, for disruption. And I would think uh, that disruptive uh, attitude uh, applies more to the Russians than the Chinese. Uh, that said, I think it's interesting that the Chinese have got a new relationship uh, with Iran. I think they just signed uh, an agreement and a lot of Chinese money uh, will flow into Iran. And I would expect that to change the dynamic. And of course, the Russians have to have one eye on what uh, Iran is doing in Syria, uh, where they are both allies uh, and competitors uh, for influence. Thank you. That's fascinating. Ambassador Haber, you, you also have deep experience in Russia as well, I think, from, from your time in the German Foreign Office. I mean, do you do you agree with what Ambassador, how Ambassador Pierce described it and what role do you think, how should we think about the Russian role over Iran going forward? I think Karen Pierce uh, has pinpointed it. Uh, um, uh, and that is, uh, the Middle East is not only a region where we actually have to focus on uh, challenges emanating from the region or threats emanating from the region or tackling uh, opportunities. Uh, there. It's also an arena uh, for great power competition. Uh, and Karin has mentioned it, uh, the Russian role in Syria, the Russian and Chinese uh, uh, role with respect to the uh, JCPOA, although I'd see that in a, a sort of different universe. Uh, overall, I think both uh, uh, countries, China and Russia, see the Middle East as a region uh, where um, American, uh, uh, the American role could be in decline, that's their perception, where um, the um, uh, transatlantic cohesion could be undermined uh, and partners could be pitted against each other, uh, something that would benefit Russia. That is certain, uh, certainly uh, the Russian perspective on it. Uh, I think we need to understand with regard to Russia uh, that um, Russia very often views conflicts not as a problem that need to be solved, uh, but actually as an asset uh, uh, that will ensure uh, its role the Russian role and the Russian status. So uh, that gives it a lot of time. And with the Middle East, uh, that's, certainly, uh, that's certainly true. I've heard a Russian foreign minister once saying, uh, with regard uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Middle East conflict, um, saying, why should that uh, be a problem? Uh, we've lived uh, with it for so many decades, uh, and we can continue to do that. So we need to see that angle, that conflicts actually uh, uh, are an opportunity uh, for Russian strategic thinking in order to ensure uh, 
what the French call a droit de regard, to in, uh, ensure a role, to ensure uh, um, to ensure influence. That's how you need to view it. So whenever we uh, disagree uh, on specifics uh, or on fundamentals and essentials, uh, it opens space uh, for Russia uh, uh, for Russian diplomacy. Thank you. Um, thank you. Fascinating. Um, Ambassador Perikio, perhaps we could get your input on, on, on the Russia question. And maybe I'll also add the next question too, um, since we're, we're running a little short on time. Um, so you, you can answer both, because I, I do want to come back to this issue you all raised at the beginning, which is on economic hope for the region and engaging economically um, for, uh, for stability. And you know, it just strikes me that the 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 makeup of the region, of course, is 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 very different than than it used to be. I mean, it was never great, obviously, in in, in terms of democracy um, and openness. Um, but we have seen something of a regression. I think it's fair to say um, since the failure of the Arab um, awakening, and this has really come to a head over here with Saudi Arabia and President Biden. Um, you know, is not engaging it seems with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, according to news reports, and is um, looking to engage directly um, with, with King Salman. Um, there is, um, you know, most European leaders, I think obviously Italy is a new prime minister, but, you know, European leaders have tended to engage, I think, with, uh, with Mohammed bin Salman. And he has been seen in some ways as a, um, as a hope on the economic side of economic reform and of modernizing Saudi Arabia. So I guess I want to put you all in the spot a little bit, which is when you when you take it down to a practical level, right? What what does it really mean to say, you know, engage the region economically when we're also balancing it with, you know, very real issues of the rule of law and uh, of of egregious actions in the very recent past? And how 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 are your governments? thinking about that. But Ambassador, if you want to draw that question, you can just focus on the Russia piece, which is also on your plate uh, as well. So thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Tim. I'll try to connect the two issues here. Because when it comes to, to Russia, um, I think that we have to, to look at Russian role as a sort of, again, of um, proposing uh, or picking, let's say, out from our shelf uh, books on the great game. Uh, so Russia uh, pay not very much attention on, on uh, people's needs of people's aspiration in the respective countries from playing a, a game that comes from, you know, uh, an old well-known strategic approach of Russia being, you know, moving towards warm waters or trying to, to put, to have a, a foot on the ground. So what, what they're there, they might, uh, uh, have some influence. This is not what we are trying to do uh, in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, just the opposite. We are 10 years on the Arab Springs. So our main focus is to empower people in the region. What we want to do is finally Mediterranean and Middle East uh, stop being the battleground for uh, exactly a great game where, where uh, foreign powers have their own um, petty uh, interest and uh, turning into uh, a time when finally we can give opportunities to, to young people, to those who want to bring democracies. They're not according to our own uh, standards. We don't want to export our models, but we want really to, to empower local populations so that there is no double standards. And this brings me to, to your uh, underlying uh, issue of human rights in the Middle East, which is so important. There is no future uh, in the Middle East uh, unless human rights are duly uh, uh, recognized, respected, and promoted. Uh, I don't think that we might uh, simply uh, um, consider that this is a side issue. It is a quintessential component uh, of the opportunities for that uh, incredibly rich uh, and dynamic part of the world to embark into a, a stable and, and sound path for development. Certainly, 
uh, there are economic interests that have to be met. So um, there is, uh, the, we have relations with, uh, with uh, uh, countries in the regions, with leaders in the regions, but we know we have paid also on our own skin the price of this. You know that a country which is so dear and so close to Italy, like Egypt, uh, since a few years, um, one of the stumbling blocks in the full development uh, of our relations um, is uh, because of, uh, of the killing years ago of a young Italian researcher there. So human rights uh, are a quintessential component. And we really we want to ensure that uh, reforms are put in place, being in uh, Southern Mediterranean, in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, a country that again, is suffering a lot is Lebanon, for example, uh, another country that for too long has paid the price of confrontation coming from foreign countries who were trying to reproduce in, in, those, in that beautiful land uh, their own conflict. Uh, we have the tragedy in, in, uh, in Syria. In Iraq, again, local populations are, are suffering. So uh, I think that uh, Europe uh, has to uh, promote uh, a policy that uh, while uh, encouraging uh, economic development and political stability at the same time does not freeze the demand of uh, those peoples for uh, more rights uh, and more democracy. This is something that we owe uh, to uh, those people, but also this is something that goes at the core of our of our you know stand on the international scene. And these were different with uh, countries that do not share of the values come from. And I get back to to, to Russia. Uh, of course, we discuss with Russia. We talk to Russia. Uh, there is no solution uh, unless Russia is fully engaged. But we don't have to be shy. Uh, uh, on our views, on our positions, because this uh, will otherwise uh, jeopardize our opportunities to play full uh, the strength of Europe. This is what Europe is, and this is what Europe stands for. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Pierce and um, Ambassador Haber, we'll come to you both in a minute. We have about 10 minutes left, and we are getting questions, a couple of questions, one for each of you from the audience. So I'd ask for your reaction to what we're just discussing and, and particularly on, uh, on democracy and you know, what it means on a practical basis. I, I know everyone will say, you know, in principle, it's important, but what does it mean particularly at the issue at Hamas Saudi Arabia in terms of the Biden administration's uh, uh, seeming approach um, that's shaping up. Um, but I would like also Ambassador Pierce to add a, a question for you that goes back to Russia. And we have someone, uh, one of our viewers, one of our audience asks, based on your comments about getting the Russians out of uh, the Middle East and North Africa, what is the UK prepared to do to help remove Russia uh, from, from the region? And what messages um, have, uh, has the UK delivered to the UAE? which facilitated the presence of Russians in Libya. So that's a, a question from, um, and Emily, there's a question on Turkey, just to give you a heads up that I'll, I'll come to you in a minute uh, on as well. But uh, Ambassador Pierce. Uh, th thanks very much. If I can just start on the democracy and economic development one, I think they're linked. I think one of the things we uh, can do that's helpful it is explain to our friends in the region why they're linked. Uh, and, and Armando set out the human rights aspect. Um, if you want foreign direct investment uh, in your country, for example, uh, the Saudi 2030 program, foreign direct investment likes the, the rule of law. Uh, and you will get further as a country in economic development, uh, the more your people uh, have human rights. So I think we we need to explain that. And I think there's some specific economic development help uh, that can be offered about shifting to industrialized and market uh, economies. And I, I don't see a contradiction there. I think just as you press ahead on the democracy and human rights point, uh, you have to keep uh, following up on, on the economic side because they, they are mutually uh, reinforcing. 
Um, and, and there's a jobs angle to that as well. You know, if we want the Middle East to be stable, we have to think of these large swathes uh, of young people without jobs. And that's an added incentive for us all uh, to work out how best to help. Uh, on Russia, um, I'm turning over in my own mind whether I mean get the Russians out of the Middle East. That was what they said in 1973. And for all the reasons we know of the Cold War, uh, that was an important goal uh, at the time. Um, I think it's more, how do you persuade the Russians uh, to assist in embedding stability uh, in the Middle East? And how do you uh, get them to be constructive uh, and not see it as yet another area uh, where they want to contest uh, the West? I think that's very hard. I think some of the answer uh, is American leadership uh, and the fact that the Biden administration will have very many uh, Russia experts in it, uh, and they have already set out their determination uh, to get to grips with the strategy uh, on Russia. As far as the UK goes, um, we um, we do push back on the Russians, both uh, privately uh, and publicly. For example, uh, in the Security Council, uh, I've done a fair amount of, of that myself. Uh, and we do talk to uh, other countries engaged in Libya, uh, including Turkey, including uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, and other countries, uh, we talk to them very uh, robustly uh, about breaking the arms embargo and about what's happening on the ground in Libya. Uh, hopefully, the um, agreement that was signed recently, uh, and huge praise to Stephanie Williams, uh, an American for working for the UN for what she did on that, uh, hopefully that will see us begin uh, to assist the Libyans uh, in getting back into some sort of sustainable uh, political process. Uh, but I can assure the audience uh, that we do take up uh, all these threats to stability uh, when we see them. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Haber, um, I guess the question on the, on, on, the, on the table is still the democracy one, but the Turkey piece of it, we have a question from a member of the audience and I'll read it to you says, has Turkey's aggressive foreign policy become a serious destabilizing factor for the Middle East um, and also for NATO itself and Europe, European allies? I'd say on Turkey, uh, very much the same thing I would have said on uh, Saudi Arabia, and that is a uh, relationship with complex partners are never ever just one angle one single angle relationships. You factor in different angles, human rights and rule of law, economic issues, security issues, larger regional issues and so forth. And there's no hierarchy between them. And if there's a hierarchy, it usually stems from context. Um, and turning now to, uh, uh, and may I say that if you look at Saudi Arabia, uh, you do see actually both. You do see uh, a country uh, that uh, has, under the stewardship of the king, uh, um, really pushed forward reforms, uh, but is, on the other hand, not ready uh, to tackle or embrace the consequences of the reforms. And that is, uh, these are the claims for uh, uh, democratic participation. So it's a paradox. And countries like ours, for the reasons uh, that uh, Karen has mentioned, and that is the link between rule of law uh, and economic investment, we have to push for both. And it works. It seems to me uh, that the um, uh, that releasing Lujan uh, al-Hazlul uh, would probably not have happened uh, if there hadn't been uh, from America and elsewhere uh, uh, a clear messaging uh, on the second part of the equation that I mentioned before. So the same is true for uh, Turkey, we uh, had all the reason to be worried uh, in Europe uh, um, in the context of uh, uh, Turkish uh, actions in the Mediterranean directed against an, um, uh, EU partners, Greece and, uh, uh, and Cyprus. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's also uh, safe to say that Turkey is part of our geography, it's part of NATO, it, it's uh, the link between uh, Europe uh, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, and if we let disagreements fester, uh, it will come with a price. Uh, and that's why our attempt was uh, just to um, do the Olympian uh, balancing act that you have to do with difficult partners. And that is uh, 
uh, try to contain uh, negative outpack, uh, 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 impact, uh, try to define avenues uh, that allow you uh, to uh, de-escalate uh, and manage uh, uh, the uh, differences. That's, I think, what you'll have to do because a one angle issue, and that is just focusing uh, uh, on, um, uh, on specific actions where um, will not get you far. It's it's not a, it's a, a balancing act. Thank you. Um, we're just about out of time. Um, Ambassador Verricchio, I'd like to give you the last word and, and give you the option to, to speak about either Turkey or Russia or, or any sort of closing comments um, you'd like to make and, and um, then we will we will finish up. Thank you. No, thank you. I, I think that this has been a great panel and I've been very, very uh, appreciative of being part together with my two um, friends and colleagues, um, Emily and uh, Karen. Um, you know, I think that the message that uh, we have trying to, to pass through uh, the audience is that uh, Mediterranean, Middle East is a strategic uh, area where uh, Europe is present. Europe really can play its full, its role uh, together with the United States. Uh, this is an area where really, uh, in a way we have the full list of our uh, uh, textbook of diplomacy, because we have strategic interests, we have economic interests, we really uh, have uh, always trying to, to put forward our human rights agenda. We don't want to uh, single out different issues. I think we owe this to the people of the region. Uh, this is an area where we are being at war for too much time, and we want beyond that. Uh, we really want to, to pursue also our uh, national security uh, using a full range of tools. We are not shy of being present where action is needed. We are present uh, against in our as members of the coalition against ISIL because we do think that uh, terrorism, uh, and we haven't mentioned this yet, still um, needs to be addressed. But uh, we have to, to use the full uh, uh, range of our tools. And this is the advantage of Europe. Because we really, uh, because of our history, because of our knowledge, because of our understanding, um, we really can uh, uh, discuss with leaders and people in the region using uh, a full range of, uh, uh, of tools and issues. And this is the best way. Um, I think it is important, it is not possible to address the many challenges that lie in the region unless we play a full our role. And working together with the United States also allow us to uh, spell out in a, a more effective, and even if I may put it that way, more um, elegant way, the issue of burden sharing. Uh, we want to, to play a full our role. Uh, we uh, partner with the United States. Burden sharing always come into equation, but uh, in a way that really shows that uh, uh, it's not just uh, footing the bill. Um, it is uh, the opportunity to uh, work together uh, with the coherence, uh, as Karen was, was reminding us, even if, if, if not necessarily always in unity, but in a way that is more effective to solve the many issues still uh, at stake in the region, that does not open uh, opportunities for our adversaries to exploit uh, our divisions and really um, is coherent with our agenda. Because our agenda is not the European agenda. Our agenda is first and foremost the agenda of people in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Their development is our success. Ambassador, thank you so much. And I'm very glad you mentioned some of those issues that we didn't have time to, to touch on. So I think it's very appropriate. It just goes to show how much is on the table, I think. Um, and it also reminds us that we must reconvene uh, to talk about this again 
um, at a future point. But I would like to thank all three of you for really an exceptional, very uh, rich um, discussion. And, and to thank um, our audience for engaging and for watching. And with that, um, this panel uh, is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.